Mr. Mills, welcome to Atlantic Dialogue Television, our perfect studios here. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here and wonderful to be in this incredible city of Marrakesh. It is a great town and you have to do a lot of public relation for it in, in South Africa. But let's talk about this theme of this conference is turmoil. But we also have turmoil in South Africa, but recently we had very festive mood in South Africa. You won the World Cup in rugby. What does the success of the team with the black captain uh, mean to South Africa and integration in South Africa? Well, of course, it's not the first time we won the World Cup. We won it in 1995 at that famous moment in Francois Pinot and Nelson Mandela lifting the uh, trophy aloft. Uh, and then again in 2007, uh, and in both those occasions, of course, there was a white captain. Uh, different era in, in each of those. Uh, and today we have a much more integrated team. And I think it shows a number of different things. It shows that, that change takes time. So a whole generation has gone by since that original victory in 1995. And with that, of course, has come the deeper integration of our sport uh, and to, to a related extent our society but also shows that what you can do in spite of diversity, in spite of the past history of inequality and division, when we pull together, uh, there's a strong message here, which is that we are all South Africans, no matter our origins. And I think the feeling around the World Cup was, of course, amplified by the economic conditions in South Africa. So it, it was a, a bit of light uh, in a very dark moment in South Africa's economic history but it showed that if we get organized, if we, if, we, if we stop thinking about the things that divide us and think about the issues that unite us, we are a much stronger nation. Is this just the moment, the instant of this black captain showing the trophy, arriving, that made the nation altogether happy and maybe united for that moment? But is it enough, a symbol like this, to change the very deep economic problems, violence in South Africa? Well, I, 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 I don't think it's enough, no. I, I believe that the, the problems in South Africa are deeply structural and, uh, and they're related to a series of policy choices. Um, but no one really before this World Cup gave us much of a hope. Um, they said basically South Africa was maybe at best the second best team behind the All Blacks. Uh, uh, maybe it was even behind England and a few other sides. Um, but there was a level of organization in the preparation of the Springbok team which was, which was, I think, unsurpassed. And they had a game plan and they stuck to it. Now, leadership is about doing that. It's about having the courage of your convictions, having a game plan and sticking to it and, and not being pushed off course by political elements. And I think what we've seen in the ruling African National Congress over the last decade is this sort of this this period of state capture under Jacob Zuma and now the the attempts to try and pull the party and that thus the country back on course once more it's an exceptionally difficult job for President Cyril Ramaphosa uh, but it's it's one that he has to do uh, otherwise South Africa will continue to slide into into failure and disappointment so the rugby the rugby side shows the importance of leadership if if nothing else the white minority, do they have, does the white minority have problems with accepting a black government? Not at all. I mean, you know, there's, it's of course on the extremes of every society there are going to be racial divisions. But, you know, South Africa is actually characterized, I think, by, by increasing coincidence around the center in terms of what people stand for. The, 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 those whites who remain in South Africa, now less than 10% of the overall population, are people who are by and large committed uh, to the country and its future. Uh, and the same applies to other racial groups. We don't see ourselves a generation on from the end of apartheid as one thing or another. Of course there are those who seek to profit from the past, who seek to profit from division, who, who want to seek to make preferences you know, forever enduring uh, in, uh, around racial issues in the economy. That I understand, given from whence we have come. But I think, by and large, the majority of South Africans coalesce around the center. What is necessary, however, is for a new narrative. Um, we had a narrative under Nelson Mandela, which was about 
democracy, liberation, liberation, liberation yes. uh, reconciliation. We had a, a narrative around Thabo Mbeki, which was, was a more technocratic government dealing with some of the deep uh, issues around inequality of the past, growing the economy. We had a, a very high rate of economic growth, at least for South Africa, by South Africa's standards, during Thabo Mbeki's period. And then it all fell apart under Jacob Zuma, the sort of double whammy of Jacob Zuma's rise to the presidency. Um, and the, the apparent corruption which existed. Which and the corruption which existed. Yeah. Uh, and, and the global financial crisis, all of which occurred more or less at the same time, around 2008, 2009. And then this nine-year period of, of really just disintegrating governance uh, and with it uh, uh, falling fortunes of the South African economy and now the process of rebuilding. The, the unfortunate truism, uh, the axiom uh, in state recovery, is that the period of recovery is normally at least as long as the period of decline. And hopefully we're going to defeat that in South Africa's case, but we've got to make some very tough choices right now. They're tough choices around what to do with the energy utility, which threatens to drag the whole country down, um, what to do with some of the other parastatals, like the locomotive uh, or the rail agency, PROSA, which has just gone into liquidation, South African Airways, which has just gone into, into business rescue. These are indicators of the problems of governance that we have had to endure. Plus, plus the violence, which you have armed violence also. Well, we have high levels of criminality. Yes. It tends to be very topical. So it's, it's, it's not countrywide. People look at South Africa and they go, oh, well, you have a very high murder rate, which is true. Uh, um, not every country, of course, is measured in terms of murder rate, so that changes that picture somewhat. And it's very topical in certain areas. Like 10 out of 150 police precincts in the Western Cape, for example, is not all of the Western Cape, it's certain key areas. But violence tends to happen where, there, where there's economic deprivation. So we remain a highly unequal society. We remain probably most unequal among the black community in South Africa, between the black elite and, 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 and the rest of black society, which tends to be congregate around the, the bottom income levels. These are very deep problems which we have to resolve over the long term through better education, over the short term through better choices. The black elite is a little decoupled from the masses, from the black masses? Are they, are they away from them? Do they still understand what is happening to them? I think they still understand whether they care enough uh, um, to, to be able to give up some of their preferences and some of their position in the economy remains to be seen. I think just as the elites uh, have always been a problem in South Africa in terms of uh, whether it was a white elite uh, or, or the whites being the elite uh, during the apartheid years, unwilling to give up some of their control of the economy, some of their monopoly preferences uh, to advantage the, the entire population, that was problematic during the apartheid years. And I think today with black economic empowerment in South Africa and the legislated privileges around race, which still remain, there's a set of preferences which is clearly not benefiting our economy overall. We, our unemployment remains stuck at an effective rate of 40%. Our economic growth has gone, has essentially disintegrated. We don't have any economic growth and we haven't had for some time. And it seems like we won't have any for some time to come because of Eskom. No, so some of, these, some of these preferences have to give way to, to, to a wider policy that, that, that assists the majority of people in the country. You're painting a picture which is not very optimistic, but also realistic, probably. To ask you a last question on uh, South African problems, um, is there fear among the white minority that they may have to leave, that they may face a Zimbabwe situation of turmoil of worse kind, that you have to depart because you're not accepted anymore by the black majority? Well, of course, there are those who might believe that in South African society and the absence of economic growth uh, and some of the pronouncements on land uh, uh, expropriation and the changing of the constitution, which is unclear why that's necessary. Uh, these things concern uh, a minority, uh, um, but I think they're probably fears that are unfounded. Uh, I think there's space in South Africa for, for everybody. I think there's a, it's a tremendous country in terms of the opportunities still today. Um, but they require everybody giving up on some things 
and everybody making a bit more effort. It's not just government's role to get things right. It's not just business's role uh, to take the pain or to take the blame. Uh, and it's not just the role of the unions to, to relinquish their demands. Everybody has to give up a bit and everybody has to contribute a bit more. But the government is, of course, the lead agency. It sets the tone. It sets the, 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 the image of South Africa, both domestically and abroad. And probably its first challenge is to try and improve uh, um, the sentiment, uh, the confidence of the business community. And disproportionately, of course, uh, that means addressing some of those white fears and insecurities to enable businesses, to encourage businesses to reinvest back in the economy. And when locals invest, of course, foreigners invest. The foreign investment community tends to follow uh, locals, whether it's in South Africa or anywhere else for that matter. So we still have to hope that rugby continues to go as well as it does and the next world champion you will champion again? Well, to take the metaphor a little further, I, I think uh, rugby shows that we can sidestep our problems uh, and, and cross that uh, try line uh, e more easily than we have done in the past. It's a country which has always been defined by a can-do attitude. We've always sort of, we've been, our, our, our obituary has been written many times. So we're going to fall apart during apartheid. We're going to fall apart during the negotiations that led to the end of apartheid. We were going to fall apart on the election in 1994. We were never going to be able to deliver the World Cup in 2010. We continuously confound our critics. But it's time that we don't just confound our critics and be, be you know, try and, and, and pull the uh, uh, victory from defeat at the last minute but that we, we institutionalize the terms and conditions and structures of government that ensure victory. And that's really centers at the moment around leadership and policy choices. Thank you very much. Great pleasure.